from USA Hockey, uh, played for Michigan, two national titles. National titles, yeah. Some time in the NHL. Yeah, Washington. Excellent. Um, he's going to talk about it. Right? Philly property. Right? Philly property at one point, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's going to talk about uh, cross ice, not only at the lower levels, but throughout youth hockey. Uh, up to you. Thanks, Great. Matt. Uh, thanks for Jeff for having me in. He kept emailing me. We were back and forth, and uh, we made a, a tour through Buffalo. I've been on the road for nine years. I'm going home tonight, finally. My wife will be really mad at me by the time I get home, I'm sure, for being gone so long. Um, but my job basically is to, to go around the country and talk about development. You know, I, I, you know we, we're going to talk a little bit about retention and some other things that can help you guys, but it's, it's trying to figure out how we can best help our players develop and reach their genetic potential. Um, one of the neat things is we are sponsored by USA or by the National Hockey League. So none of your players' dues, none of the coaching dues, none of that goes towards the ADM. So whether you're a true believer or you're a guy that's on the fence or you know you just can't stand us, you know none of your money is going towards what I do. None of my hotel, none of my travel, any of that stuff. Um, the NHL fully supports it, and so it's nice to be able to stand here in front of you and say, hey, we're backed by the National Hockey League. We do a lot of events with them. Um, you know, we go to meetings with them. I build it, you know, daily in those guys. We can talk about how we can get better players. You know, and it's in it for them too because in the end, they want more hockey for life. They want to sell more beer and hot dogs eventually. You know, that's the goal. Keep more people in hockey. Um, I have a short video. You know, I can kind of skip it for the parents. Usually it's with the kids, but it's with the Olympic year coming in. It's kind of nice. Amazing awaits where we least expect it or are through training for it all our lives. It awaits in 200 meters in a hundredth of a second. In our courageous first steps and with our every last breath. It awaits on the shoulders of our teammates, in the footsteps of our heroes, when we shatter records, and when our spirits prove unbreakable. Amazing awaits when a small town playground takes us to the world's stage. And when that distance is measured in effort, when our hope makes us hopefuls, and bravery carries us on her back. It awaits when we cross finish lines and when the journey has just begun. When we come from nothing, from nowhere, over hurdles, over mountains. Amazing awaits in our Olympians, in all Americans, and the honor of victory and the glory of pursuit. It awaits when we work hard enough, walk badly enough, and refuse to say, We've had enough. With a nation behind us, with a world before us, and within us all. Amazing awaits. So obviously as USA Hockey, we want to do the best we can for our American born hockey players. And that's kind of where the, the ADM comes from. Um, and and here's, here's why I'm here. How many Americans in the top 25 of NHL scoring? <coughs> I think there's two. Six. Six. Who are they? Anybody name them? Last year's. Last year's Americans in the top 25. Kane, oh, Bobby Ryan. Kane, one. Ryan, no. Phil Kessel. Um, Kessel, yes. Phil Kessel, Kessel too. Um, He's going to make this year's Olympic team, I hope. Ryan. Ryan Kessler? Kessler. I already mentioned Kessel. Oh, yes. Yeah. Two. Pacioretty. Mm -hmm. Last year, Max Pacioretty. Connecticut. Wheeler, Blake Wheeler. There's somebody you never even heard of him, probably. Mm -hmm. so, Scott Boy. Okay, so but here's the problem. Okay, step on is the other one. Okay, but here's here's the end for reason. Here's the issue. We don't have enough. We can't name them. I sat at a level three and level four and you know, with a lot of good hockey people. I said, hey, can you name the top six Americans out of the you know, 25? They said, oh, some of the people were like, maybe like Ovechkin. And I said, uh, Stamkos. <laughs> No, Marty St. Louis. Oh no, Marty St. Louis. Okay, no, he's not. But he played college hockey. UBS. Okay, exactly. But it's hard because why? Well, why are we in this situation now? Because at a young age, we tell kids to do what? 
Dump it off the glass. I coach the Ivan Polenka, which is the top 18-year-olds in the world. Okay, over in over in Europe, we go to Slovakia, Czech Republic every year, and the glass is about this high. Okay, I've been the head coach, the assistant twice, and guess who took all the penalties for shooting it over the glass? <laughs> the U.S. and Canada. Okay, because at young ages, we're like, get it out, get it out. We hear mom and dad in the stands yelling, dump it in, dump it in. You know, get off the ice. We don't want them. We want them to possess the puck. But if you're telling them to get rid of it at an early age, I tell my kids, I don't care if you make mistakes. Possess the puck. Pass it to somebody. Or put it to space. That doesn't mean you can't dump it, but dump it to space so somebody can get it. But dump the puck. Just getting rid of it, you're giving up chances to score. Okay, how's your retention rate in your organization? We have any board members here? Webster board members? You know, how's your retention rate? Are we retaining kids? 60% of our players drop out before their peewees. 60%. That is a monstrous number when we already have a sport that's pretty expensive, right? You know, my son started uh, youth soccer. He's been playing soccer for a little while. A couple hundred bucks, you know, you get registration, you get a ball, you get a pair of shorts, and then it's a shirt, and then you're done. Hockey, you can't even get a stick for that anymore, right? We're buying these sticks and these skates. You can't do that. You could pay a whole year of soccer, two years probably of soccer, for what you can for hockey. Okay, so we already start with this big a number. Now, if we're losing 60%, it goes to this, okay? Adopters of the ADM, 43% more likely to retain kids. What is the ADM? The ADM is not just my hockey. You know, this is, yes, this is the ADM out here. Okay, but the ADM is helping with retention as well. And I think every organization should have a grow the game coordinator. If a kid leaves your organization, then this should be a board position. You should be able to call that kid or have reference of it and say, hey, why'd you leave? And this kid may say, hey, I want a different organization. Fine, what can we do better? You know, what can we do better as an organization? The kid said, maybe, hey, I quit. Well, why did he quit? You know, was it the coach? Was it the ice time? Too much? Okay, but these are things we should think about. We're trying to grow our beautiful game. Okay, we need to be able to keep growing it. So people who have adopted the ADM, Mike's through Peewees. Okay, I'm going to talk about why it is in Peewees and Squirts as well. But they're 43% more likely. Why are kids quitting? Okay, why do we have such a bad number? Why are we not developing players? Adult competition imposed on young athletes. Okay, we overcompete and we undertrain as well. It's about winning. It's about winning. Okay? And I'm okay with competition. I'm as competitive as the next guy. I play Division I baseball as well in Michigan and hockey. I want to win. Okay, but there's a time and a place. You you, you go to an NFL game, the, the, <coughs> these guys are getting fired. What do the NFL coaches talk about when they lose at the post-game conference? They talk about, man, we didn't win. Some of them are saying that now. They're like, oh, we just, you know, that's what we want. That's right. That's what fans want and that's what organizations want. But what are they telling their players? What are they talking to about the media? The compete factor, the execution. Our quarterback threw six interceptions. He didn't execute. They're talking about skills. Like, what skills are they getting to win? Okay? And too often we're pushing this winning concept to young kids instead of the development concept. They might know uh, Zanea Char. We have any Islander fans in here? I hope not. But. <clears throat> The Sabres are probably worse than the Islanders, so if you're a Sabre fan, I feel bad for you as well. Islanders, Zidane Achara, when he was an Islander, first came up, he was an awful, terrible, terrible hockey player. Zidane Achara, you know who he is? Big defenseman with the Bruins for a little bit there? Still is now. Best defenseman in the league, got cut from his youth hockey team at 16 years old. Cut from the top team. Pretty good hockey player at 19, 18 years old. And that's what we have to do, keep these kids in the game. We also have to focus on windows of trainability. Okay, what is windows of trainability? Well, the goal is to have athletes reach their full genetic potential. We got a lot of this right now, okay? A lot of moving our kids around. We got the big kid, he's getting all the attention, right? He didn't even make our picture. He's getting all the attention, but in the end, it might be one of these guys, or girls, who are your national hockey league players, or women's national team players. Okay, so we have to keep focusing on all these guys. The pool needs to stay large. And that's what I like, Jeff, to tell me that you guys have a house program. Those house squirts and bantams and peewees, they need just as much ice as the travel kids. And how do you do that? It was like, oh, there's not enough ice. I'm going to show you how to do it. Okay? Um, so where does the ADM come from? Now let's talk about the development side. We talked about retention a little bit. Here's why we're here today. 485,000 junior and youth players, 293,000 in the United States. Well, where do those guys come from? A lot of them come from Minnesota. A lot of them come from Manitoba. Sweet. Minnesota has more players 
than the whole country of Sweden. Okay, New York, not far behind, 34,000. Can New York put a team together in this Olympics to play Finland or Sweden? How do we do? <laughs> we do okay? <clears throat> you think? Three, three captains. Three yeah, captains. Yeah, a lot of them, Callahan dumps it off the glass. He's a good block, shot blocker, and he's a hell of a player, Callahan. I know what you're saying. You know what I'm saying, though? Mm -hmm. And he's a hell of a hockey player. Obviously, Kane's a different story. He's a skilled, skilled guy. Okay? But that's the thing. We only have three or four players that could play on that team. We'd be short a lot of hockey players trying to put together an, uh, an Olympic team. But we should be able to if we're doing development right. And everybody says, oh, the Swedes, the Finns, you know, they, they're okay. They only have a blank percentage. You know, we're up to 23% in the NHL now. But shouldn't we have more than them? Shouldn't we just demolish those guys if New York and Minnesota have as many players as Sweden? And obviously there's some differences. You know, they, they have more control over their players. Okay, but I'm asking big organizations, you know, strong organizations to step up and say, hey, we're going to focus on development first. And you may lose six or seven players along the way, and you guys as parents, you know, I always say you're, you know, you're, you're making a choice. You're, you're hurting your kid if we're not doing it the right way. And, and things change. Development has changed. I, I don't coach the same as I did eight years ago. Okay, we shouldn't. Your kid's not wearing, a, remember the old Jofa helmets? Anybody remember the Gretzky Jofas or the Messier Winwell? Your kids aren't wearing those, right? Why not? They're terrible. They're terrible helmets, but they were pretty good back then, right? You know what? The old coaching methods are terrible. They're not, they don't do us any good. We've gone further. We've done more research on how and development should happen. We travel the world. I've been in Sweden and Switzerland and Finland studying hockey. The statistics, though, because God. Sweden are on the ice. I mean, you go back in time. When I was in Canada, on We're the gonna get Canal, they, a bunch old, of businessmen that go down, change his skates, go down through blocks and get in this parked car and go. Are they full of practicing? <clears throat> no, I was just saying, I mean, we're getting there. I'll show you yeah. this, a clip from Sweden where I've been. Okay, now this is another step. This is, we're going to take it one step back. Okay, we're going to go college hockey, USHL, North American, Canadian Hockey League, which affects you guys a lot. World Juniors, 18, 17. And then you're told, you divide that by that, and that's your development percentage. Okay, how we're doing. It's okay. Not great though, right? Now, you ask about Sweden. Skeleftia, Sweden. Population 40,000. How many players in Webster use hockey? From bottom to top? 500. 500. You guys are bigger than this organization. Six <coughs> first round draft picks in here. How many first round draft picks in Webster? They all, they all go to AAA to other organizations. And, and, that's, and that's one of the issues. But you know what? I was in Rochester Youth Hockey today. You know how many first round draft picks they've had? <coughs> exactly. That's why we're behind. We need to do it right as a group. As parents, as coaches, we need to commit. Okay, and that's why these European countries are doing so well with the little number of players. And, and they have other things that are in their favor. They have a, a, a you know, a, usually a pro club, and the kids can't leave, so they control the organization. They basically say, hey, if you don't like what we do, see you later. You can't play anywhere else. The parents drop them off the rink and say, we'll see you in an hour. You know, they're not bothering the coaches. So we have a little different dynamic. But here's, here's what we're talking about. You talked about a lot of ice time. Seven and under. They skate only twice a week. Ten and under, three times a week. Twelve and under, four. If you look, the ante goes up. Okay? But we're too serious, too fast for our kids. And that's why we're losing the 60%. Multi-sport, late specialization. I told you I played baseball at Michigan. When I stopped playing baseball, all of a sudden, Tim Army, I'm like, I used to be able to tip, tip pucks here, tip pucks here. All of a sudden, pro hockey, I'm like, I can't tip pucks anymore. Why? I wasn't taking batting practice. I wasn't fielding ground balls. Okay? I, so all of a sudden, my athleticism, I'm like, what the heck's happening to me here? It's hard to have a three-sport athlete anymore, though. I mean, they're not allowed. No, but here's what we should do. And I came across it in Saratoga Springs. My kids, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. My son's eight, playing B, tier two hockey, you know, whatever you want to call it over there. That's all you have at that age. He's a last year Mike. And he also played for a, a travel soccer team. This great Colombian coach, I love them. I love the coaching, that's why we're there. I'm writing down all these drills that I can bring from soccer to hockey. All of a sudden, the fall's over. I'm like, oh, you know, okay, see you guys later. Where's the end of the team party? Paid my 400 bucks or whatever it was, a little expensive for travel. And what did he say? He goes, season's not over. I mean, what do you mean it's not over? It's hockey season now. He goes, no, it's still soccer season. See you later. So what he does now, my son, he practices on Mondays. 
he doesn't play any, I didn't pay any more money because it included winter practice supposedly on Mondays. But the kids are practicing twice a week and they're playing games on Sundays in the winter. And as a parent I said, you know what, he's done. He's done. And it's our choice. We <coughs> control our interaction with our kids. And then you know what, in the spring, he'll play probably still one thing in soccer or he might not play at all. And you know what, he's starting to hate soccer. He loved it. But now that he's going to games and all this stuff, and I thought, I felt bad because you know, I paid for some of this and he should go a little bit. But I'm actually looking back saying, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe he should just be playing hockey. You know, and in the spring we'll play baseball lacrosse. And the thing is, as you get older, we talk about three sport athletes, it decreases. You get a two, maybe you get a one, a specialization at 16 years old. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So long-term athlete development is what we're talking about. LTAD, it's in golf now, it's in baseball. Um, you know, we're starting to really get this. In a female, peak height velocity is maturity. Males, obviously a little later than females. We all in here as, as adult males, some of us grew at 14 years old, some of us grew at 18 years old. Some of us are still growing. <laughs> Pizza was phenomenal, by the way, yeah, thank you. So you have skills, speed window, simple drills, the ball drop, you guys have been on. Take the little kids, at mites, at squirts, at peewees, drop two tennis balls, the cross balls, what do the kids do? They get ready, no sticks, boom, they accelerate as fast as they can to catch those tennis balls or those lacrosse balls. That's the speed window for the young kids, female, male, six, seven, eight years old. Um, those off-ice cars that you guys have seen in coaches <coughs> clinics, in gym class, okay, we don't get to climb the ropes anymore, they cut those down because they were dangerous, you don't throw red balls at anybody, right, dodgeball, we don't play that anymore, too dangerous, we don't go play in our neighborhood, we miss the, the neighborhood where you can just walk out the door and mom and dad say, I'll see you after dinner when the street lights come on, yeah. it doesn't happen as much anymore, we're scared of that white van coming out and snatching our kids, okay, so we need to find athleticism. We need to develop this stuff that we used to do on the ponds, in the backyard, playing touch football with our friends. Now it's, it's touch Sega, you know, or touch Xbox. I'm in the wrong generation. <laughs> Xbox, you know, uh, PlayStation 12, whatever they're up to now. Okay? And then obviously after peak height velocity, you get your strength window after maturity. So we got to hit these windows of trainability for our kids if you're going to reach their genetic potential. Certain things you can't do anything about. Martin St. Louis. He was never going to be big. His mom and dad are tiny. Okay? But you can do your athleticism. You can do your strength. Those are things you can hit. This is what the long-term development stages look like. Active start, fundamentals. What are you guys noticing here? What increases as we go up? And what word do you not see until we get to the top? Win. 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 <clears throat> Win. We're talking about training. We're talking about teaching kids to compete. Okay? In Europe, there's not a full ice hockey game in Sweden until you're 12 years old. They're focused on development. They're focused on ice touches. I'm fighting still, mainly in Western New York, over full ice mites, AAU teams. You're, kill you're killing your kids. If your kid's playing full ice mites at seven or eight years old, you're hurting your kid. You put them in that Jofa helmet and you set them out on the ice. Okay, that's the old coaching. We're, a lot of us are starting to get to the point where practices are getting there. Okay? You know, I'll show you why full ice isn't good for your kids. So, make development a priority. Emphasize activity, athleticism, positive learning environment. This was the old practice. The new coaches. This was sent to us by a Division I hockey coach. This is his son's Aren't team. Are we lucky to have the whole ice tonight? <laughs> that. That's your money. <clears throat> this is why I want to kill someone. <laughs> we get all kinds of stuff in this thing, huh? Coaches. This one we happen to use. It's parentless. And you should be mad. If you see this with your kid on the ice, you should be mad. If you see your kid standing in line like this, you should be mad. Okay? Here they move. Okay, they're moving. This is the mic version. We're going to show you today, if you watch, how we're going to do the squirts and the banners. You should see movement. You should see activity. You should see touches. Okay? This is obviously a mic version. Everybody's moving. Everybody's moving. There's 60 some kids on the ice out here. 60 kids. They're all moving. Making passes. You see there's almost, there's a little line here of four. That's it. This is your standard mic practice. Six stations. You can change it. There's 40 kids on the ice. Alter it a little bit. That's the fun part about, fun part about coaching. Okay? Here's the version. I'll like cut off my slide here. Um, so that's six station mic practice. 30 to 50 players. 
you know, four stations, peewees, you can make stations longer. You're going to see a station today that we do on the ice that there's going to be a skating from here to here, okay, because they're older kids. They can open the station a little bit. Okay, bams, two stations. Some of us still use three. If you split ice and bams, you can go station here, station here, station here, and the other team can go down to this end. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to break it down and do it. Now, why is it so important? Traditional practice, 25 touches. We're talking about the activity tracker. It's on ADMKids.com. You can pull it off. Um, or ADM, yeah, ADMKids.com. Pull it off. 25, traditional practice, 30, 30, 80, 90, 70. Who's getting better? The station-based practices. Now, games. I was in uh, New Jersey at a level three. We did an on-ice session. It was in the, you know, right as summer was kind of airing. I asked the kid, well, what, what are you doing this summer? What else have you done? He goes, well, what do you think he said? Playing summer hockey, I'm driving to Boston to get ready for full ice mites. So we can play mites. Well, this kid's eight years old. And we shake our heads and go, huh. But think of the crazy stuff we do even as squirt and peewee parents. Focus on developing. Okay, your kid's not missing out on anything. As long as you're getting the right number of ice touches, you're getting good coaching, okay, which obviously you guys are off to a great start. Because I've got people that are afraid to bring me in. Okay? And it's all about learning. I learn every day. I've learned more in the eight months I've had this job than I've done in my whole playing career and my whole coaching career. I've learned more about coaching young kids. I thought I was pretty good, I thought, at coaching older kids. But it's a, you don't treat an eight-year-old like you do a 16 or 17-year-old. It's different. They have different mental capacities, different physical capacities. And we have to remember that. Okay? 35 minutes puck time in practice. So I was convinced uh, for all that time the kid went to Boston, the parents just wanted to go and stay in hotels and drink beer. So, and it's fun. It's fun for us as parents. But we have to remember what we're thinking about the kid. Uh, AU coaches, probably the most important. Okay, because that's where they start. Intro to athleticism, speed, quickness, play to learn. Uh, I'm going to walk you through. This is all on the, the website. Okay, but I'm going to walk you through this real quickly. Uh, 30 to 50 players each ice session, two to three ice sessions a week. Okay, we're not on four, we're not on five times a week. Okay, don't be afraid too to throw some pucks out in pond hockey. Let the kids play. Okay, let them have some fun, especially at this age. Why cross ice hockey? <laughs> the game of tennis just became kid friendly. Now it's easy for kids to learn the game with smaller courts and equipment sized right, so they'll develop faster and have fun along the way. Find out more at tenandundertennis.com. In Europe, they've been doing this for 15 years. All of a sudden, can you name any of the top Americans besides Venus and Serena Williams in tennis? They've fallen off the face of the earth in tennis. This is ten and under. This is tennis's answer. But yet, us in hockey, we'll take an eight-year-old and put him on a giant surface. I'd like to see that eight-year-old pitch from a major league mound. I'd like to see the eight-year-old run up and down a full soccer field. It doesn't make sense. This is the one thing in my whole job that I can't get my arms around, why people don't understand this. I really can't. This is the one thing. There's a lot of other things. I, I taught U.S. history for a while, and, and we deal with politics on the conservative and the liberal side. And I, I try to get all that. You know, I disagree, but I, I see and I, I listen. But this is one thing I, I have trouble understanding. I'll give you one minute. Far away. We can. One game a year on the big ice going full length like the NHL guys give them that thrill. Just one one game. But you know what? It's the parents that get the thrill. The kids, if they so? Yeah, if they do not in New Jersey now, there's all but six teams. There's cowbells, there's air horns. Those kids wow. know no difference. Yeah. I'm telling you, once you go as a parent, if you tell you, my kid, he doesn't know any better. He has a blast. He's laughing and having fun. Guess why? He touches the puck a lot more. He plays the game. It's the parents who want it. The kids think they want it. Okay? Here's an example. Your kid comes home with Halloween candy. He's got a full bag of Halloween candy. You let him eat the whole bag that night? You know it's not good for him to eat the whole bag. No, you let him take a couple out and you say, okay, later. You know full ice isn't good for your kid. Why do we put him on the ice? You buy, we buy into technology. We buy into this. This is the research. This is what's good for our kids, okay? And, and you know what? I, you I, won't even have an issue in full ice if mom and dad are like, no, this I'm is just saying <coughs> once. I'm just saying once. But it's not good, so you're going to let them eat the whole bag just once? <coughs> no. I, I, well, I disagree with you. I mean, I coach the kids long enough to realize that 
the kid got a real big thrill of skating through and scoring with a, with it set up like a game. He had fun. Yeah, a lot of kids are very nervous about going to full ice too, though. I mean, my daughter didn't want to play anymore when she found out oh, she had to go up to full ice. And I'll give you the retention <coughs> numbers are bad because of full ice, and, and I'll show you after. You wouldn't put your kid on a, on a big league mound, would you? No, it's I, the, but it's the same thing. That's what we I'm don't. I'm not taking it to the extreme. I'm not, I just told you why would you do it once. Here's once. Here's once. Another parent sent it to us. Number 11 will have fun. Yep, you know whose parents sent us this video? Number 11. Number 11. <laughs> but do you know why? You know that what the parents said in the, in, the, in the video, in the email when they sent us? My kid's not developing. I'm upset. I want my kid to play half ice. And even though he scored eight goals, it's not doing my kid any good. Here he goes again. He doesn't stick handle. Okay, he doesn't move. He just skates by. Really, these kids give up. They give up. It's not doing him any good. Watch how many times he scores. And he gets five shots a game, maybe six shots a game. You catch him on a half ice serve. He's got to move. He's got to make play. Why oh, this kid? This kid's on moonwalk back here. <laughs> okay, I'm rooting for this kid. Just slash him. Slash him. No. Never catches him. Okay. There's his only goal. Nice. Okay, but he's not learning to play. It's Look, he even goes way out here. Because he outskates everybody. Okay? Not good for our kids. These kids aren't getting anything out of it, and neither is this kid. Okay, is this hockey? For your reference. Think about it. As an adult, Michigan Stadium, University of Michigan grad. I took this picture from up top. They have press boxes with uh, you know, I called the the guy from uh, Red Berenson in Michigan. So I need your best picture from up top. Here it is. Six-year-old scale, 310, 131 wide, which basically is from here to here. 300 yards long. Goal line to goal line. Oh, that's 300 feet, sorry. 300 yards, 100 yards feet. 300 feet. Okay, now, as a six-year-old or seven-year-old, if you're an adult and you're going to play a men's league game, here's what it would feel like for your eight-year-old to play that one to two games of cross ice or full ice hockey. That would be like you skating on a rink that was from here to there. That's a big hockey rink for an adult. That's what it feels like for your seven or eight year old to be playing on a full ice surface. We don't do it in soccer, we don't do it in baseball. Why do we do it in ice hockey? Not just for little kids. You ever been to a pro practice? Who are these guys? Looks like a mic practice, doesn't it? Some of the best players in the world play cross ice hockey. But we still want to put our little kids on a big surface. There they are again, the Penguins. I have tape of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks playing in a one-on-one -on -one right in here. 12, 10 U, golden age of skill development. Okay, we want to keep working on skills, keep working on um, skating, pivots, things like that. Okay, learning to train. Now we're talking about the windows of trainability. Four ice sessions per week, seven month season. Okay, so what do you see as I go through these? What changes? Repetitions change. The seriousness starts to change. Okay? Our kids get a little more. We're ass backwards. Everybody gets two sessions of ice. Mice get two, squirts get two, peewees get two. The older kids need more ice. They need more touches. Okay? We, we burn our kids out. Mice squirts already. Okay? We burn them out. 16 and under, three to four sessions, 160 total. Repetitions, 18 and under, 125 total ice sessions. Okay, and that's we have to be careful of the house kids too. That squirt house kid, he might be your NHL player. We don't know that. So let's give him the chance to develop. Okay, and you can do it by dividing ice, 50 to 60 kids. You know, as, a, as the ages go up, you put less kids on the ice. But I'll show you today, we have a Bantam and Pee Wee group, right? Okay, so these are pretty big players. And we're going to show you how to divide it up a little bit and, and show how their skill development. And you're going to watch today. We'll play two games at the end. Everybody says, oh, you can't teach systems. I know college teams, Skidmore College, Middlebury's won many national championships. They don't play a single full ice game in a practice, not one. They teach breakouts. They teach board checks. They teach angling, all of it in small area games. <coughs> Sorry, see NHL teams do more. Why? Because that's where the game's played. The goals are scored around the house. We talk about the house as coaches, right? 
Okay, it's all stored around there. What does LTAD stage? Is LTAD is long-term athlete development. <coughs> okay, back to that original sign and the, the curves. Okay, we're looking for skills, suppleness. The 12 and under window is probably the most important for skill development. I watched, uh, I was telling you about the Wheatfield Blades. You know, they took all the kids from all over Buffalo and they had the sweet square team. I went and watched them practice, 11 kids on the ice. Guess what they did all practice? I put the activity tracker in the parents' hands. The kid had 10 shots on goal, 15 shots on goal. Guess what he did most of the practice? Wait in line with a full sheet of ice. They waited in corners. With 11 they, kids. With 11 kids. You know why? Because they had line in this corner and a line in that corner. And the kid would skate across, he'd give him a pass, he'd skate all the way down the ice, he'd take a shot. After this kid made a pass, he'd skate over here, he'd make a pass to him, and he'd go down the ice. These are nine-year-olds. You know what they also did? Another NHL to ice, do in Washington. Kids in this corner, kids in that corner. The nets were on the pegs. The kid would pass it out to the defenseman, the defenseman would walk the line and take a shot. How many of those shots do you think made it to the goalie for a nine-year-old kid? <laughs> I saw one or two and the thing went, yeah. the rest of them were bouncing. <clears throat> okay, we're not helping those kids. Those kids went from the best kids in Buffalo probably at that age. Some still are gonna make it just by shit luck. Okay, but the other ones, they may not get any better. Or they may get better just because they're physically gonna keep getting stronger. But we're gonna lose those kids. We're hurting that kid right now. Okay, um, my name, Matt Hurd, Matt H at USA Hockey. Let's answer some questions. I know I, that's a good question. Thank you for your, your input and debate. Um, we're going to agree to disagree, I see, um, for sure. But I'm telling you, you're hurting your kids. Even if you throw them on the ones, yeah, it's fun. But guess what? I got in the Atlantic District now. There's only six teams, and they bump kids. In New York State, you're not allowed to bump a kid to squirts. By next year, I'm hoping the Atlantic District will be 100% cross ice hockey. And you walk in, and you would never know that the kids aren't having fun. They're down pumping their arm, you know, scoring goals. They're celebrating, riding the stick. It's like they won the Stanley Cup. They're keeping score in some instances. Others, they're not. <coughs> okay, you would never know. Sweden and Finland, like I said, you won't see a full ice game until 11, 12 years old, depending on where you are in the, the region. So what's the approach for the organization that is perhaps working against the parents who are really looking so we, when you go back to retention, you talk about retention, and it honestly it comes down to if we stuck to our guns and said we're going to do ADM, we'll lose, we'll for sure lose parents in that space. Yep, and you're going to lose the ones that you're probably going to lose. And your hope is that you're going to gain, and I've seen the results, the beginning, the beginning study. Um, the Niagara Purple Eagles, they started with 102 mites, and they stepped up right away and said, we're going to be an ADM organization at the might level. They're doing it okay at the squirts and peewees. You know, it's, it's all, we're always trying to get better. Guess what they have in mites this year? 162 freaking mites. Amherst, big organization, huge. 362 mites. ADM, 100%. Okay? Is there a lot of options for full ice in Buffalo? There's. Six AAU teams, no. I think. That's an interesting question. Though. Six so or so. How do you think that retention is going to work? I mean, when you talk about retention, there's one thing: kids loving hockey for the rest of their life. Jumping organizations doesn't worry me that much, right? You want the kids to love the game, but if you all of a sudden quadruple Webster's capabilities, you don't have ice. Are you using your ice to your capacity now? No, no. no. it's not as. No. Not as third sheets, not as cross ice sheets. Yeah. Is that what you're? I'm saying practice sheets. Now game sheets. You know when you get to score at PV, you're playing full ice. A little tougher maybe to schedule some games. That might be a little trickier as your as your program grows. So it'll be interesting. But what I'm saying, you can't crystal ball fast forward. But it'll be interesting to see if you actually double, triple the size of these organizations. It'd be interesting to see if they graduate. You know what we saw in Colorado Springs when they they adopted the EDM, their program doubled program. Obviously part of it is you get, there's a lot of stuff that comes with the a model program. Right. And we give you money, we give you boards, we give you all this stuff. Uh, I, I'm in there five days, you know, five times a year for a model club. Um, but those programs have stepped up and said, we support your model. We want to develop players. And these guys, you know, they actually are building their own rink because they have it. They know that they're going to buy X number of hours of ice. 
every year. They can, they can fill their own hockey rink with the number of kids they have in their program. And that's basically Amherst has trouble. I mean, they have, right. they got, what do they have? That's what I was thinking. Over 1,000 kids, 800 and something. They have a ridiculous number of kids. And they basically fill North Town Center. You know, one of the struggles we have is that uh, we do have a, a ton of great coaches. Yep. But at the youngest age group, we're a volunteer-based organization. So we rely on people that are possibly new to coaching. They yeah. love the game, they know the game, they play the game. But just like me, it took me a few years to figure it out, right? How do I teach this game? We, we call it a, a club culture, okay? I and mean, Jeff and I were talking about it a little bit. Every, every, every group should have a program coordinator. So your kid might be a squirt. You've gone through the issues, you know, now you understand the game. You might be the program coordinator for mites. You might design their practices. You might make sure they're doing it right, go on the ice with them five, six times. There might be a squirt coordinator. Okay, but there's a culture. And you can't be afraid as a program to say, hey, I'm going to spell this out to you. We're going to have a parent meeting every fall. I'm going to say, hey, you're going to get X amount of ice sessions. Your kids are going to play equally. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Parents know what they're getting right out front. You create a culture. You're that squirt coach. You're the program. Maybe you're the program coordinator for the mites. This is how you're going to run practice. This is what we're going to do. The parents know. The coaches know. They know what they're getting from Webster Youth Hockey. They walk in that door. They know what they're getting. They know what their money's getting them. Are you actually saying possibly that, you know, if you went hot and heavy following what you're saying, that you'd actually have maybe three teams out there practicing at once doing cross ice? Or is that oh, too many what, or two? Or? And I'm talking just practices. Right, Game, right. square pee, they're going to play full ice hockey. Oh, right. Even though, by the way, Minnesota has started a pee-wee half ice league in Minnesota. Right. The more touches, they're going, they're going full after it. But they also play full ice because they're pee-wees. But they're starting to play instead of two full ice games. They're starting to play one half ice, one cross, one uh, full ice game. And like, what, what age? How, how old of ages would you even propose that three teams could be on the ice at the same time? I mean, I how would far put, you go? I mean, we're gonna have today what about 40 kids, and you're gonna see a Pee Wee Bantam. Those kids are pretty old, right? Yeah. 40 kids. So two. I would, I would have two major teams. I would have up to 40 probably is your max for Bantams. You know, mites you can put, I've, I've done 75 kids in the first Niagara Center for mites. It's a lot, it's almost too many, but you can get comfortably 60 kids on the ice. That's what I was just going to ask. Like I said, my son's in mite. Yep. So we have a mite A and two mite Bs. So you could technically have all three mite teams on the ice at the exact same time. Yep. How much ice do you lose? Like surface area do you lose going from half ice to third ice? You don't lose any. You gotta you gotta coordinate together. What I was telling Jeff what Team Comcast does, they'll give the same practice. So say what's your name? Todd. Say Todd's your mic coordinator. <coughs> He'll send the A, the B and the C the same practice plan. But you as a coach know what the practice plan is. You alter it. You know the cones are gonna be set up here. You know the tires are gonna be set up here. You alter your station based off of what your skill level is. If your A kids are toe dragging pucks Maybe they're toe dragging pucks in the stick handling station. If you're the C team, maybe you're just going around and faking a little bit on a cone and then shooting. You know, maybe the, the A team is doing a Savar spin. Maybe the C team's just going around the tire. You know, so you can put everybody on the ice, set up the stations, and then in the end, so you have your small area game time. You put the A team on one end, you put the B team on the other, and you put the C in the middle. And they play cross ice hockey. You work on breakouts. You work on four checks, and you do it through small area games. We're going to do two games today. You're going to see a regroup game and a, I call it the Gretzky game, we'll call it the Kane for these young kids, okay? <laughs> you know, where we put a kid behind the net and the puck has to go to him first, and then they can attack. So you can work on that with your A team, but the, you know what, the C team might not be able to do that. You might just draw a line in the ice and say, okay, everybody has to be on side for the might C team. You know, or, you know, I can teach all the time, but he says, well, you know, Cross-ice hockey, you don't know what offsides is. We had a kid tell us today, he goes, I know what offsides is, I do it in uh, Xbox all the time. You know, you can teach a kid offsides in 15 minutes. We do it with mites, our mites, our mite eight-year-olds, they know how to do it because we draw a line on the ice and we say, okay, this is offsides in a half-ice circumstance. You can't go over the line until the puck does. And you can teach that in a half-ice. 
you'd be amazed how many half ice practices don't use between the blue line and the center ice. Yep. Anyway, I have to keep reminding myself. <clears throat> Let's get beyond the blue line, yep. spread out. That's your out. third station sometimes. Get out there, you know. Yep. And, uh, that could be your third station. You're going to see a funky setup today, and I did it on purpose. It's, it's kind of an L, and you'll see some real tiny game on one side. You'll see a long skating area on the other. And we're only going to use four stations. If there's 40 to 50 kids, it might be a little tight. Um, but normally, if, there's, if you get to 50, I would expand the next station and go to five. But I wanted to try to show you a couple different setups that can happen. So, and, and some people say, hey, the coach, the A, the B, the C team, they're all working together. You coach my kids, I coach yours, and then I take my kids at the end, and they run the same practice. Others will say, no, I want my kids, I want to move with them. You know, but it's that club culture of working together, trying to develop players. Because that C kid, if your kid's on the A team, that C kid might move up to the A team next year if we do our job right. And too often, that C kid's like, I'm no good, I'm going to be on the C team forever because nobody's, and, and you know what, that C kid practicing with the A kid, that gives them a little bit of juice. That gives them a little bit of incentive. And I'm even in favor of, if you have a really good squirt, I practice squirt and peewees together sometimes. You know, depending on how many kids you have, if you have the group, you know, like in Saratoga, we just don't have enough uh, older mites. So sometimes we'll, we'll take the six or seven older mites and we'll practice them with the squirt bees. You know, we'll put them together. And they're not gonna necessarily, they're not hitting yet, they're just angling, they're bumping, you know, things like that. It's a good experience for those kids. You know, or we'll put the square A's with the PVBs. We just gotta make sure we control that. So but I think might help in the future. One thing I don't know if everyone has seen it in here or not, but uh, I was down at ESL the other night, <coughs> and uh, they had red, white, and blue out there. They have um, temporary boards, you know, we're still using pads to separate the ice. Yeah, I was definitely going to bring that up. They have those temporary boards, and it's the first time I saw them, I thought, well, there, there you go, that's the next step. There's now a grand the kids program. feel like they're on a, a and, and that's what I was saying. And, and they actually have curves in the corners as well, right. so you're not getting, you know, New York State, the, New York State <coughs> gave away, I think, $80,000 this year in grants. Oh, really? Hmm. Okay, and we, maybe we got to do a better job of getting the word out, but for every sign-up we <coughs> gave in the national office, for every that your kid paid, we gave $3 back to New York State to go towards development. So I think they gave away, you know, each, some organizations got 5000 some got three, had to write a little grant, and in New York State sometimes it's supply boards. So next year, whoever your you know, board members, don't be afraid to write a grant and ask New York State for Santa to bring you some boards. I, th I think they're, cool. they're awesome. Two doors on them. I use them for practice. I'll put peewees out there with practice. I think that kind of goes to what Fred was saying of the overall, like, just the atmosphere, yep. right? You get the black mats on the ground, it's like, yeah, it's kind of hokey. Yep. You put those boards up, it's like it's they're, awesome. on a, they're on a real rink, right? I've it's seen them in netting go up. Some kids for fresh babies love to practice, and they'll attach with the giant industrial clamps, nets on each side, and then they'll hook eyelets into the boards. They'll screw them in, put the eyelets there, and you got yourself too many rinks. We got anybody who's handy in here? Okay. That's not me. But does set up, does set up time cool. for something like that take away from the ice? <laughs> you, have to let, you have to, when the Zamboni's on, the boards have to be out there. And while the Zamboni's going around, you line them up. There's a video on, I actually have a video, I took it at uh, the Ice Ball down in New Jersey. They have all these freaking cameras, they have 10 cameras around the rink. And you can watch them set it up. They'll set it up in 10 minutes. Right. They while the Zamboni's on. So when the Zamboni makes the wide pass, you set up the boards that go this way. And then as the Zamboni makes the other pass, you keep adding boards. Time the Zamboni's off, shoveling it, you're clamping in the last board. But you need help. You need. I've seen it with two people, I've seen it with three. One's kind of hard. I, I missed your earlier presentation, I apologize, but no I have a quick question. Uh, if you look at all the practices over the course of the season, how many of them should be run like this with three teams on the ice versus you know more traditional half all ice or all full sheet? All of them. All of them should be multiple teams on ice surfaces, <laughs> multiple use of ice facilities. If you I'm, take, I'm, asking, I'm asking two versus three. Two teams versus three teams. Depends how many numbers you have on the team. If you're, if you're abiding by the USA Hockey 11, you know, a lot of times you're talking about a nine, nine team might team, you know, a nine, usually nine players per might team, eight per might team. You know, you're going to be talking how many might, eight times, you know, nine, eight times six, depending on how many, you know, I would go over 50 mites, 55 mites, squirts, maybe 45, 50. It depends what your numbers are in your organization, depending on, like in Saratoga, we have an issue because we have two B teams, a C team, and an A team. 
one of the C teams has kind of the leftover kids, they call them. You know, some of these kids are actually going to be pretty good hockey players. They're just starting. But there's too many up. So you can't combine the A's, the two B's, and the C's. They're combining two B's and a C. And the A's combine with the Pee Wee's sometimes. It just it, it depends how it works out, the number of kids. You know, and the optimal number is for your comfort and the ability to run a practice, a good practice. And you know, we'll see how we do with 40. Um, I appreciate your time. Looks like the Zamboni's on. I want to make sure we have enough to explain to the coaches so you guys can see a, you know, a, a good practice with 40 kids at a, at a high level. Thanks, okay. man. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.